Great. Well, uh, thank you, Dan. I just want to make sure that you can see my screen uh, as well as hear me before I get going. I, I can see your screen and I can hear you. I hope everyone else can. Okay, well, then I'll, uh, I'll start going. So thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure uh, to be part of this. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, uh, Young Ping. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Yan, uh, for this invitation. Now, today, um, I'd like to speak to you uh, about some of the work that we're doing at the ADB to really think through what does it mean for us to uh, respond to the COVID-19 pandemic? How does this change the way that uh, we do our work, how we invest uh, and support the developing member countries of the Asian Development Bank? So as part of this, uh, I want to share with you uh, just global context. I'll actually um, highlight some of the things that Young Ping has highlighted uh, uh, already. Uh, we work together, so we, we, uh, we talk about this very often. I wanna talk about the response to COVID and then of course the recovery from the COVID pandemic as I think they, it's important to treat them a little bit differently. Uh, and then lastly, to, to highlight the role of ADB. Now, if we look at some of the global um, indicators, now this is a, a graph that has just been published uh, last month by the, Asian, or the International uh, Energy Agency. And this highlights the expected um, energy demand from 2020 compared to 2019. And if you look across the different fuels that are highlighted there, coal, oil, uh, nuclear, um, the, you see that the overall uh, energy demand, the total energy demand, we're looking at uh, over minus 5%, but across the different energy vectors, you have different levels. And I think the one to focus on is renewables. And I think that's really interesting to see that we're uh, expecting a, an increase in the share of renewables uh, during this, uh, this year. And twofold uh, reason for that. One is that um, generally the market structures under which renewables act uh, give them first priority. Uh, there, well, and I guess there's three, three aspects. The, the, the second is that they're, they're zero marginal cost. Um, often when, once they're built, once they're, they're going, uh, you may as well use them because there's zero marginal cost and no, no fuel cost. And then third, there have been a lot of deployments that were, were just about finished at the beginning of the year. Those got finished and now we're starting to produce. The two other uh, things I want to highlight um, is the bottom two. The CO2 emissions are down this year, which is a positive thing. I think many of us have experienced the cleaner air, especially in urban settings, uh, based on both power and, and transport decreases. Uh, but of course, this isn't sustainable under the economic conditions that have been brought on by COVID. So although it's positive, uh, I don't think we see that as, as uh, continuing. And then lastly, of course, the energy investment globally uh, down, uh, expected to be down uh, over 17 and a half, around 18% this year. And from that perspective, um, that has impacts directly on economies, uh, but also can have knock-on effects in the long-term energy supply. Now, um, if we look at, at this, we see, of course, decreased uh, demand across all energy vectors, but renewables. We've seen an oil price uh, decrease uh, due to the pandemic, but also in combination from uh, some geopolitical market fighting. Um, what's interesting, when we look at the reductions in power demand, we see that largely uh, coal power has been decreased. Um, this has happened in US, in Europe especially, uh, but in other markets as well, including India. Um, natural gas demand has decreased, um, but actually that's mostly in North America and Europe. We've actually seen some strong uh, increases in Asia. Uh, power sector decreases were um, dramatic during lockdown, but we're seeing in some countries, the power sector is the one, uh, the one uh, energy vector that's uh, recovered quite quickly. And then as I highlighted earlier, the reduced investments um, in the energy sector could cause long-term volatility. 
Because if, if the investments in building the infrastructure aren't there, once recovery happens, and we've seen this in other crises like the great financial crisis in, in 2008, 2009, that demand can, can recover quite quickly. And if it, if it does um, on track to pre-pandemic pre um, situations, uh, if the investments aren't made in, in new infrastructure, both supply and uh, transmission and distribution, this could uh, create a peak in, uh, in demand in uh, prices. And that, that could be challenging for some um, markets. Now, when we look specifically um, in, in Asia and Pacific, as I mentioned earlier, a lot uh, cleaner air in cities. This was refreshing. I found uh, in, in where I live in Manila, uh, I, I got to see many new things uh, because of less pollution. I could see some mountains in the uh, far off in the distance. Uh, so oil demand uh, highly decreased. And this was uh, of course a benefit to uh, countries who are net importers. So the, the decrease in demand saved them uh, from their, their national treasuries, but then the knock-on decreases um, of price reductions allowed them to save, save money in that context. Um, coal decreased as some markets switched to gas. And uh, I'll, I'll go straight into the, the next point that the natural gas spot price has taken a, a real hit. Now, and again, when I hear discussions of gas, those who, who aren't working in the energy sector, um, I think don't see the full picture of, of how some gas is traded on long-term contracts, some are oil indexed, and some is, is uh, traded on a spot price. What's been interesting on the spot market, because it's been so low, those countries who have had excess regasification capacity were able to take advantage of that. And then... Although we have seen recovery in some markets, it's been quite uneven. And, and I, I would point out one particular market, um, those countries that have high tourist um, tourism shares in their GDP uh, have just remained highly, highly depressed economically and therefore their uh, energy sector recovery, especially in the power sector, just has, has remained depressed and has not uh, recovered. So, all countries are impacted uh, globally um, by the, the energy sector changes, uh, but definitely have some specific uh, contexts. Now, during the, the response phase, we've really seen that energy plays a vital, vital role. And it's been great to see that energy needs have, have been met reliably. And this, this is a, a tribute to the past investments that have been made in Asia and the Pacific, uh, uh, where ADB has been a part, but of course there have been many stakeholders playing a role. The power sector, when we look at the, and, and natural gas utilities really have faced a, a twofold impact. One is just reduced volumes uh, in whether they're power or gas that they're selling. So they, just that decreased demand has impacted them. But then also the ability to pay by consumers uh, has, has been limited in some cases. Now, there has been some government support to allow those, to, um, uh, allow those consumers uh, to pay, but still uh, utilities are really taking a, a big hit on that. And in some cases, if they have negotiated take or pay contracts on the, the fuel input side, um, you know, they are really impacted by these reduced volumes and uh, uh, lack of ability to pay by consumers. When renewables have provided more um, share of, of power in the uh, various markets, this has been great because it really, um, it really has shown that the uh, integrating renewables may not be as difficult as uh, some people had uh, expected. And then lastly, uh, vulnerable populations, yes, uh, some have received financial relief, sometimes from uh, project developers who uh, on pay-as-you-go systems, for instance, I've heard of many uh, project developers who have just simply allowed the systems to operate without payment. Uh, they, can, they can open the systems as, as it's called. Um, but indeed, from a long-term perspective, uh, those companies can't afford to do that. And uh, there is a, um, a belief as people are, are, are potentially going to be 
uh, pushback in their, their economic status. Uh, there's also uh, many who, who may lose access to these basic energy services um, that, uh, that they have gained over the last number of years. So technically we've seen great things in the energy sector, but the, the financial impacts uh, are, are looming large. Now, as we start to move forward and we look at what, what is the guidance that we can provide uh, as we go into the recovery phase. Now, what we see, you know, it's, it's, I think, very clear that the energy sector investments are, are not only essential to support recovery because they contribute to so many industries and businesses and have contributed through the response phase of COVID-19, but they can also contribute uh, directly through investment uh, in these countries. <laughs> in the energy sector um, to, to support the, the stimulus that, that we expect will be coming. But then we also want to focus that. And we see that um, four pillars is that where how we've positioned our look. And while we don't see a huge change in the way that ADB will be um, delivering um, support to our de developing member countries, we do see uh, a chance to accelerate some aspects. So the first one is, is enhancing sustainable energy services. As we look at the technologies uh, that are available today, the, the market models that have been proven, I think that there is an opportunity for countries to reset some of their uh, investment plans. And, and we've actually seen this already. A number of countries had a, a significant share of coal power uh, planned in the near future. Um, some of them have stopped that. And I think it's a chance for them to go, okay, how else can we do this? Can we deploy energy efficiency technologies? Can we deploy uh, renewables? Um, so I, I think this is a great opportunity uh, to support that. Um, improving energy sector resilience and security. This, so on the renewable side, uh, a number of markets have seen higher shares so they, they can feel more comfortable with integrating renewables. And then on the other side, I think that countries uh, are seeing a new threat uh, to how their energy system operates and may look for opportunities, say, to do more contactless um, payment, uh, more remote monitoring. Um, and, and other techniques to, to really make sure that the system can be managed even in the context of a pandemic where people are on lockdown. On the other side of it, with lower oil prices, um, then bringing on uh, lower diesel prices, there are gonna be countries who are gonna take advantage of that and say, okay, well, we don't have to worry about renewables because uh, diesel is so um, low in price. That's a little bit of a concern because we do see those prices recovering and um, I think it's an important point to, to continue on the pathway of, of trying to, to use more indigenous renewable energy in the future. Um, access, uh, accelerating access energy to the poor and vulnerable. I think this is, as we see stimulus, we've seen uh, people who don't, who have access or who may lose access. This is our opportunity to go in there and continue to uh, support uh, these populations. And we've seen that in one of our projects in, uh, in India where um, they did a, a transmission, or it's actually it was a distribution project, and they added some piloting for some uh, mini grid projects. I think that's a great example of looking for opportunities to, um, for new solutions that can uh, provide that access to energy. And lastly, um, as we see uh, advanced technology coming, there is, there's been a huge push uh, I'd say globally uh, during this pandemic to look for these opportunities. We've seen solar decrease in price. We believe that there's other technologies such as the hydrogen economy um, that could be pushed uh, during this time that could lead to long-term opportunities and as well cross-sector interventions, looking at ways to support the health sector, the transport sector with electric vehicles, uh, schools, um, making sure they have uh, uh, energy so they can do remote learning. So as we've seen the technology, regulatory and market maturity uh, occur over the last 10 years, I think there is a much stronger case uh, for moving to a low carbon energy sector. Now, as I come to my last couple slides, 
I just simply want to um, highlight that uh, ADB has been working in a way that's been aligned with the uh, sustainable development goals, with global climate goals, and with ADB strategy 2030, which really looks a lot more cross-cutting at the development paradigm uh, than previously using the, the, the sector approach of energy, transport, health, education. So really looking at addressing poverty, addressing climate change, uh, livable cities, um, these types of ways of looking at how we can support developing member countries. And um, as we look to um, evaluate our, our energy policy, which was, was the current one was produced uh, and, and accepted in 2009. Although we see it still addressing these issues very effectively, it is a good chance for us to really take a look and see how we can uh, update this and become even more relevant. Um, over this year, ADB has been incredibly active. Um, we're looking at uh, in, um, lending about 4.2 billion. As of December 1, uh, we're at about 3.1. So we got a little bit of work to do yet this month. Uh, and looking forward over the next year as we see uh, about 5 billion each year. Uh, and I'll note that the, the clean energy shared about 40 to 50%, but that is, it is quite important to note that transmission and distribution, the way um, we uh, allocate it or, or, or measure it isn't considered clean energy, uh, but at the same time, we see it as a, a very important enabling uh, technology to support uh, clean and low carbon energy. So I believe this is my, my last slide. Um, we're going to continue to focus uh, on acute needs of the pandemic, but at the same time, uh, deliver on our existing pipeline and, and continue to, to support countries. And we see this really happening uh, through policy dialogue um, to really support this green recovery, trying to listen to countries and find out what their needs are, how they've shifted and how they've re remained the same so that we can continue to support them with renewables and energy efficiency. Transmission and distribution, we have a real strength here and uh, we will continue on this and um, adding to that uh, innovative new technologies and whether that's in the hydrogen space, whether that's in the mini grid and micro grid, whether that's remote monitoring, looking for those opportunities where we can advance technologies. Um, we'll develop knowledge project products so that we can take any lessons that we learn and spread it across the countries. And last, last of all, cross sectoral, sectoral support, I think this pandemic has again encouraged us to, to step out of our uh, energy pillar and really take a look and see how can we uh, talk with our other colleagues, understand their needs, whether that's in the health sector, whether that's in the education sector, and really try to support them so that they can, uh, we can help enable them to deliver on their mandates. So over the last number of years, we felt that we've been on the right track uh, and we're going to continue that uh, in encouraging a green recovery that will uh, go forward in the future. So with that, I will end and uh, say thank you very much. I pass it back to you, Dan. Thanks, David. That's a, a great overview to set the scene for our sessions here today. Uh, and you were you were two minutes short, so uh, with that as a as a benchmark, I would remind the other speakers to try to keep it under twenty minutes.